Builders, Builders, Gutenberg Suffers, and Photographers, Harley here with another House of Hacks video. I know this was supposed to be part two of making soft jaws for the vise, but I'm currently in the process of working on that, as evidenced by my red fingers. And uh, last night I was talking to my dad about scanning some negatives for to convert them to digital. And uh, that kind of inspired me to do this video, where I kind of go over some of the details that I've done in the past for this project. So uh, this video is going to be about converting negatives into digital pictures. I got this idea a couple years ago online from somewhere. I thought it was DIYphotography.net, but when I went to look for it, I couldn't find the original article. Uh, I did find two other interesting articles, though, on that site about how to do kind of the same task but using a different manner. So if you go to the, I'll put a link down in the description. If you're interested in some alternatives, go check them out. DIYphotography.net is a great uh, resource for do-it-yourself photography ideas. Anyway, this is one that I put together a couple years ago, and uh, that's what I'll be showing today. Okay, we have a pretty simple setup here. We just have a cardboard box with holes cut on both ends and a camera pointing into it with a means of holding the negative. In this case, I have my camera here set up with a radio trigger on the top and I'm using a holder for an enlarger to hold the negative. You could just as easily use a piece of cardboard cut out with a hole in it. On the other side of this box, there is the flash with the other end of the radio remote. And inside the box, there's a piece of paper. Get some light inside there. So you can see it's just taped to the top of the box about halfway back. And that acts as a diffuser so we don't have a hot spot coming from our flash. To get the best image possible, you want the negative to be as large as possible on in your image, on your sensor. And uh, to do this, typically you need to zoom in as, cl as close as possible and get the lens as close as it will focus in order to get to maximize that, that image. In my particular case, I have four lenses and um, two bodies that I can choose from. One of the lenses won't fit on one of the bodies, so that reduces me down to seven different possibilities uh, or potential lens body combinations that I can use. Um, in order to try to maximize the number of pixels, pixels, the number of pixels horizontal and vertical for the final image. So I took some test shots just to see which combination would give me the, the largest um, the, the largest final image. First of all, I checked my my full frame 5D, and I uh, I couldn't use the 1855 lens that only fits on my crop crop sensor crop factor sensor camera. Um, but I tried the Nifty 50, and I tried the 75300, and I tried the 24105. And in testing the, the 24105, I noticed that the autofocus will only go down to a certain range. That lens also has another focus range called macro, but you have to manually move it into there and manually focus it. So I actually took two, two um, images, test images, with the with the 105, and uh, you can see it, see the difference between the regular that the autofocus goes to and the um, macro mode, which really isn't a true macro. Um, then my other body is an XTI, a crop factor, and so I tried that with the 1855, and also the 50, the 75300, and the 24105. And out of these seven combinations, surprisingly, the one that gave me the largest image on the negative, or largest image of the negative, was the 1855 on the XTI. So that's the one I used. Um, if you have access to a, macro, macro, a true macro lens, that's actually better because it's it, uh, a true macro will give you one-to-one -one, um, recording of whatever your subject is onto your sensor. And so if you have a 35 millimeter film and you have a full, fa full frame camera, then one-to-one -one is going to be a, a perfect match for the film size to the, to the uh, image, image sensor. If you have a crop factor, 
then you don't need to necessarily go all the way to one to one, but the macro lenses are designed to focus very, very close to the lens. And so you can you can, really can maximize the, the image usage with the macro lens. Uh, you can rent those if you don't have them. They're not terribly expensive to rent for. Now that we have the box made and we've chosen the camera and lens setup, the next thing is to actually physically set it up to take start taking pictures. The first part is to make sure that you have the distance correct to make the image as large as possible on your image um, and still be able to be in focus. So that's going to be controlled by which camera and lens setup you have. Once you have once you have things set up in focus, then the next thing is to make sure that things are plumb and level. You want to be able to get the, the um, film plane on your camera to be plumb and parallel to the negative that you're taking the image of. This way you eliminate uh, parallax errors in your images. The way that I did this on mine was to use the bubble level on my tripod to get my camera plumb and level. And then I just assumed that the floor and everything up from there was close enough uh, for the purposes that I have here. If you really wanted to dial it in, you could put another bubble level on top and use shims to get everything exactly right. Um, next was, is to make it parallel this way. And to do that, I put a straight edge across the back and measured with a tape measure to each side of the box and, and got that so it was exactly the same. And that should get things really dialed in pretty well. Uh, last thing is to make sure that the image is centered as close as possible within the viewfinder. Uh, that way you don't have distortion from the edges of your lens going on. Uh, next you need some sort of remote for the flash. I'm using cheap cactus radio triggers. You get them on eBay for about 30 bucks. Um, you can also use more expensive ones. You use whatever you have. Uh, also a corded where you, you have a something fits on the hot shoe with a cord going around, as long as it's long enough, that would work too. You just need to be able to trigger your flash from your camera remotely. And finally, it's not, not required, but makes things much easier is if you have a trigger for your or shutter release remote um, for your camera. And um, so that's it for the physical side. Next, to set up your camera, first thing you want to make sure that you're shooting in RAW mode at your highest resolution. Uh, you want to be able to have full control of color balance and exposure and your highest bit depth possible for your post-processing. The only way to do that is, is with RAW. JPEG just won't cut it. You lose too much information when things are saved to JPEG. Next is the exposure. Um, for the flash that I have, I have quite a bit of flexibility on controlling the, the intensity of the flash. And so I just set my f-stop to be in the middle of the range for the lens to eliminate the most dif uh, diffraction from either wide open or, or shut down. And then I adjusted the exposure on the flash itself. If you, only, if you have a cheaper flash that only might have two power levels like my other flash, then you'd have to adjust your f-stop um, accordingly to get to kind of dial things in. Uh, shutter speed is, uh, has to be below your sync speed. I just use 125, it makes it easy. Um, and I, so I just use 100 as a standard rule. Um, so that's it for the physical setup, that's it for the camera setup. At this point, you're ready to uh, just start taking pictures. Okay, at this point I assume you have taken all your photos that you want to take on your negatives and you're ready to do some post-processing. This is all going to be in Photoshop and Bridge uh, because that's what I have. The concepts are transferable to other applications if you have them. You just need to figure out which commands they are to do the same types of things that I'm doing in here. So the first thing is to uh, rotate and crop the image. So this is going to open it up in Bridge uh, where we'll have up here at the top we'll have our straighten tool and I'm going to just drag this across the top here like so and then we can crop this down and I like to give it a little bit extra headroom uh, on the outside so I can do final crop in, in Photoshop. Uh, this is just kind of a first pass to make the file sizes manageable 
and uh, so forth. You can see here I didn't get the negative quite square in the holder when I took this particular image. That's pretty much all I need to do here in Camera Raw. I'm going to do everything else in Photoshop or I can put things on layers and, and uh, that kind of thing. This, th this base cropping is going to be the same for all your images so you can actually apply this in Bridge anyway. You can apply this once and then tell it to do it to all the, all the files that have the same setup. Um, and so it makes it uh, easy. These first several steps, they're going to be the same for all the images in a given um, shoot for a given set of negatives. So you can actually make, make uh, actions out of these to kind of repeat so you don't have to sit there and continually go through clicking on all these different things and repetitively. So we've got it rotated, we've got it cropped. The next step is to go up to Image and go to Adjustments, and under Adjustments you have Invert, and that will convert this from a negative image into a positive image. And you can see our color balance is a little whacked out, so that's going to be the next thing we, we tackle. Um, I like using curves because it's a kind of a one-button adjustment here. I just use this uh, middle uh, eyedropper tool which sets a gray point, so I can s click on that and then click on something that should be kind of a neutral white gray color, which I'll use my brother's pajamas here, and we kind of, our colors get pretty nice. Uh, it's a little, little whacked out, but not too bad, much better than it was before. Uh, one thing I noticed too is that these images are always really soft, and to fix that I like using a high pass sharpen. So I duplicate the background layer with a control J, and then I go up to filter and choose other, and then high pass. And your radius that you use is going to be dependent on um, the size of your image. Smaller images you want a smaller radius, larger images you want larger radius. Just kind of use what works well. For this for images of this size, I like four. It tends to work fairly well. And um, then we go into our blending mode and change it from normal to overlay. And now we have a sharper image. It's not still it's still not super sharp, but it's better than it was. This is what it was out of camera, and this is now what it is with an overlay, a uh, high pass overlay. So it's quite noticeable. That's before, and that's after. That's pretty much what you would do to every photo in a given set. Um, Anything after this is probably going to be uh, done on a, on a per photo basis rather than on across the whole batch. So next thing I'm going to do, I, I noticed on my histogram um, that I draw, it's kind of dark. There's a lot of um, area over here that we can kind of bump that up. So I'm going to go in here and add, um, add another layer. This time I'm going to use the levels and I'm just going to drop this white point down to where we're just kind of starting to clip some of the bright highlights like so and that kind of brightens that up and do a before it's darker now it's much much brighter nicer exposure now with that being brighter it's more noticeable that this couch is kind of blue and it's it, I remember that couch that was originally a black leather couch that my parents purchased long ago and so I'm going to use kind of the hue saturation. This is just going to be a quick, quick change. I'm going to go in here and just there. Since there really aren't any other blues in the image, I'm just going to select the blues and just desaturate them. And that fixes that couch up pretty nicely. It's still a little on the blue side, but not too bad. I guess I could probably go in and the cyan's and play around with it more. But eh, for this, it's good. Uh, I did lose some of the blues in my brother's uh, pajamas there, so I need to go in on the on the layer mask and just paint in some black and bring those bring those back back in kind of like so and then I do a final crop on this particular image and uh, do something sort of like uh, get I'll get rid of all this yucky stuff on the outside edges and uh, about like so and you end up with a final image 
Actually, I think I missed something there at the bottom. Let me do that crop again. I'll bring it in here. I think I took it down too low as well. Trim off the yellow on the top right and the gray on the bottom right. And then get rid of that yellow over there on the bottom left. And there we go. There's a finished image. Um, like I said, the first first several steps you can put in an action and, and save yourself a whole lot of hassle. Then each individual photo is going to need a little bit of touch up, um, like I did on this one. But that's pretty much it for post processing. That wraps up this House of Hex episode. If you liked it, hit the thumbs up button. Next episode, we should be back on track with part two of the Soft Jaws project. To be notified, you can hit the subscribe button up here. Next, until next time, go make something. Doesn't have to be perfect, just have fun.